Let's take a look at Bricks and Brutes, a castle wall building game for kids. We would like to thank Nanolocity Games for providing us with a review copy of this game. Bricks and Brutes was designed by Michael Ott. This kid's game was funded through Kickstarter in 2020 and is being self-published by Michael under the publisher name of Nanolocity Games. This wall building game is designed for two to four players aged six to 13. An average game takes under half an hour, though it's fairly random, so it's hard to tell exactly how long a full game is going to take, but always under half an hour. Now, the components of Bricks and Brutes is one of the main draws of the game. But here's something a bit odd about this game that surprised me when I opened up my copy. When you get a copy of Bricks and Brutes in the mail, you don't get a box. All you get is the shipping container with the game inside it, like the components for the game inside it. Yeah, I don't think there's any plan for this to actually hit retail. You are going to be ordering directly from Nanolocity Games or not getting this game at all. So as for that shipping box, when I did open this up, that was stuffed. Like they, they did some, some math to get everything to fit. Um, it was stuffed with wooden blocks in two sizes, a small brick and a rectangular brick, yellow recycled plastic mason ponds, purple recycled plastic brutes, and a bunch of yellow recyc recycled plastic gold coins. Um, there was a small card holder, like one of those plastic two-piece card holders that holds the cards for the game as well as the rules. Now, there's not a lot of cards. There's just wall cards and reference cards. Finally, there's a larger-than-usual 10-sided die with etched symbols on each side. Under all that, I did find a cloth bag. That becomes your box for the game. Once you've unpacked it all, you just toss everything in the bag. Now, as for these components, they're all excellent quality. Um, I especially appreciate the use of recycled plastics for all the pawns and coins. Um, there's a particular brand of toys we were buying for our kids. It's that exact same material where it's like a speckly. You recognize it instantly if you've seen these recycled plastics before. I also like the uh, the fact they added happy faces to the masons. Like it's just it's a nice touch. And the brutes are frowning. I don't. Know, I got a kick out of that. And I do like the fact the die is etched. It's not silk screened or heat transferred. So there's no worry that the symbols are going to rub off on this one. Now, the rules are really simple, a folded strip of paper that's two-sided, short, clear, and simple enough to read just before playing the first time. As you might expect with a game designed for 6- to 13-year-olds, the rules aren't rocket science. No. I do find it interesting, though, that the game uses a D10, mm -hmm. as that's not something most kids will have ever seen before, perhaps, and can be a great introduction to polyhedrals. Now, for playing Brits and Brutes, you start off a game with each player taking one yellow mason uh, figure. I, I, I loathe to call them meeple because they're not quite meeple shaped, but they're, they're meeple. Um, four coins, one small brick, and two large bricks. You're going to get a random wall pattern card uh, is given to each player, and then the youngest player starts the game. Each turn, players are going to go through three actions in order. First, they're going to build the castle wall. For each mason they have, players can move one brick either from their personal supply of bricks to the wall or from one part of their wall to another part of the wall. When building the wall, you're trying to match the pattern on that wall card you got at the beginning of the game or the card you currently have. Get to that in a minute. Next, you can go shopping. You spend your coins to either buy more bricks, buy a new mason, and or hire brutes. Now, when shopping, in addition to just buying bricks, there's also a little trade system where you can trade in one type of brick with a coin for a different type of brick. Last, on their turn, players are going to roll the die of fate, that's the 10-sided die, and do whatever it says on the die. Now, the die of fate has 10 sides. Most of these just give players one or more bricks and one or more of the two sizes, or a number of coins, or both. In addition, there are three special symbols on the dice, or three special events. One is the dragon. The active player picks another player and eats one of their brutes. If that player doesn't have any brutes to defend their wall, it eats their mason. A player without a mason can't build, so they're going to have to save up five coins to replace that mason to even keep into the game. Next is the queen. When the queen comes up, that represents the queen changing her mind on how she wants the walls to look. Players all pass their wall cards to the right and now have a new pattern they're trying to build. The brute is the most interesting of the die faces, in my opinion. If you have any brutes when you roll a brute, you're going to grab them and you're going to pick another player to raid. That player then takes all their brutes, and both players are going to roll their pawns. So you're literally picking up the meeple, basically, and throwing them on the table. 
brutes on their stomachs face down count for nothing because they've been knocked out those face up count as one point they're still conscious any that land on their like standing up count as two because they're still standing at the end of the fight if the attacker has more points in brutes than the target they get to steal a brick from the other player play continues around the table with each player taking these three actions in order until a player completes their wall having it match the wall card they currently have and that player wins so nice and straightforward Though I have to say, and I, I, the way that they have used and referred to the queen in this game is unnecessary and kind of troubling. Uh, there are any number of ways that they could have symbolized the need to change your wall's design, and using an outdated trope about indecisive women is is just not needed. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with you on that one. Now, when I first looked at this game, and I was asked to do a review, this is one they they pitched me. And I saw these pictures of these wooden walls with these these yellow and, and, and purple ponds standing on different spots. And it really reminded me of Crossbows and Catapults. This is a game I remember very fondly from my childhood. And I got to say, immediately upon seeing that going, oh, it looks like Crossbows and Catapults, I agreed right away to check this game out. I am sorry to say this is not a retheme of Crossbows and Catapults. Actually, it's not a dexterity game at all. While I thought you'd be trying to knock down walls, instead you're doing the opposite. You're building a wall. And while that does require dexterity to build, that's not actually part of the game. So that's similar, say, for example, to um, The Climbers, which is a, a, a much more complicated game where, yes, you're stacking things, but it's all about just trying to build the wall. And then online, there's all these pictures of these walls with workers on them. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with the game. Like, that, that's artistic. You don't actually place your workers on the walls during the game. Though I got to say, my kids did end up putting workers on the walls during the game, but that's not actually part of the game. Admittedly, giving six-year-olds catapults and crossbows is probably something that should be avoided in most cases anyway. Yeah, fair enough. I don't know. Just looking, I thought you were going to flick the discs at the wall. It just wasn't what I thought. So this isn't what I thought it was. So what is it? Well, it's a rather light, highly random take that game. It's dead simple to learn, easy to teach. Even my youngest daughter picked it up right away. Now, despite being rather light, there are some interesting decision points in the game, which is what I like to see in a kid's game. Deciding what to spend your gold on is, is your biggest choice in the game. It can be very interesting. Do you save up a bunch of gold to get a second mason? Because once you have two masons, you can move two bricks a turn. Well, that's great. But if you don't have the bricks, those two masons are wasted. And it's going to be hard to get the bricks if you spent all your money on, waste, on masons, for example. Uh, is it worth getting a bunch of brutes just in case you get the chance to raid another player? Or should it be the arms war and you get a bunch of brutes so no one raids you? You're probably going to want to get at least one brute because that dragon is devastating if you don't have a brute to protect your masons. In the end, though, the randomness of that 10-sided fate die is going to have a big impact on any particular player's ability to win. Now, what I do like in this, especially when played with three or more players, is to take that elements of the game do tend to prevent a runaway leader if one player starts to get a bunch of lucky rolls on the dice and roll and gets all the money or all the bricks. And then the other two players do have a way to kind of counteract that jumping ahead. Right. And while not ideal, especially for modern hobby gamers, reducing the strategy in favor of randomness is a common theme hmm. in many games aimed at younger players and can help circumvent lack of attention or focus yep. that might be needed to uh, deep, do deep strategy. And there is that hoping to roll for the thing. You definitely saw that with the kids, right? The, oh, I hope I roll money or I hope I roll that brick I need. And the, the, the expectation of the, the anticipation of the die result is definitely part of the enjoyment of the game, especially for my kids. Now, my favorite thing about this entire game is that brute battle. Now, this is the second game I've ever seen that has you rolling your workers, right? Rolling your meeple-like dice. Uh, the first was Breakdancing Meeple, which I reviewed back in August, which I thought was a really great method. Now, these aren't meeple, but they're similar. And I, everyone I played this with, uh, adults and kids, loves rolling those purple pawns, looking to see how many of their brutes are standing or not. Now, I got to admit, no one yet has rolled the standing brute. So I, I, I assume it's possible that if they land the right way, they can. But anytime we play, the brutes are always face down or face up. The problem with this mechanic, though, is it doesn't happen enough. Like the brute is only on one side of the 10 sided dice. So you only have a 10% chance of ever rolling that. Plus, because of that, spending all your money on brutes seems to be a bad strategy. Despite wanting a whole bunch to attack or wanting a whole bunch to defend, you're going to spend that money and it may never even come up. 
I personally think this game could have been improved by having a second brute symbol uh, on the die. I'd, I'd either to probably replacing one of the you just get a couple bricks uh, sections because that would both encourage players to buy more brutes as well as letting you get that do that fun thing of rolling your brutes more often. Yeah, it's always interesting how to determine the odds when building a game like this. Even uh, the fact that they went with a D10 tells us something. But if in playtesting, the Brutes weren't seen in the same light as, as the way you've seen them, and, and with that fun level you have, yeah. uh, you know, we can easily just leave them as one of the three special events to try and ensure their rarity rather than encouraging what you've seen as a fun aspect of the game. Yeah, it was the, the kids seem to be the same too. They, they seem to really dig that aspect of it. So overall, uh, Bricks and Brutes, a dead simple game. Um, for just my wife and I first played it without the kids, we thought it was great looking. It definitely has a nice table presence. It looks like you're building walls because you're building walls. You want to talk about tying in the theme. That definitely worked. I just wasn't that engaging as gamers. Now, once my kids sat down and plays, that's when the game started to shine. Both my girls really enjoyed the game. They love stacking up their bricks. They like placing their pawns on the walls. Um, particular, my youngest always put their mason where they were going to put their next brick, which actually kind of gives something away if someone was going to raid her, but she can always move it somewhere else. Um, and they also love to take that element. My kids liked being competitive and rolling the dragons and picking which of their workers to eat. And of course, as siblings, they tended to pick on each other until then they decided it was time for dad to go down and they just kept picking on me. They loved raiding the other players' camp. They loved rolling the brutes. They loved stealing bricks. They cheered when they got a good roll in the die and, well, laughed at the other players when they rolled something bad that didn't help them. Now, what this means overall, of course, is that bricks and brutes seems perfect for the market it's targeted at. It says it's for 6- to 13-year-olds. I will say no hobby gamer is going to be entertained for, by this for long. Um, maybe on a you know New Year's Eve night at 3 in the morning after some adult beverages, they may have some fun. But you know what? Kids are going to love it. Uh, I assume most people's kids are probably going to love it as much as mine. It's a simple to learn, easy to play, quick game with a great table presence due to some great components. And really, you know, the kids loving it is what matters the most. Yeah. So for a deeper look at Bricks and Brutes, head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. <laughs> 